So, first question is about the periodic table. So here we've got outline of the modern periodic table. Which element has four electrons on its outer shell? I'm hoping you guys know that the group numbers tells you the number of electrons in the outer shell. So group one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The only one that's a bit weird is group zero, technically called group zero or group eight. So you can tell um, that it's got full outer shell. So the group number tells you that. So which one has four? That'll be whichever one's on the group four. And that's J, exactly. Well done. Which two elements in figure one are in the same period? So groups go downwards. They're the columns. And periods are the rows. So which ones are on the same row? So these are higher questions, guys. So most of it will be relevant to foundation, but not all of it. M and Q, excellent. Everyone getting that? M and Q, amazing. Which elements react with potassium to form an ionic compound? Right, let's go on to our notes. Ionic. How do you know something is ionic? How can you know something's ionic? How can you tell something's covalent? How can you tell something's metallic? Yes, ionic is when you have a metal and a non-metal in it. You need to have both. If it's a non-metal and a non-metal, that's a covalent compound. And metallic is obviously just metals. That's why it's called metallic. So metal and metal. Uh, watch, I made a video a few days ago on how to remember these. So go and watch that if you're struggling to remember this. Um, electrostatic forces, yep, that's what ions are. The electrostatic forces of, of attraction between oppositely charged ions. So yeah, definition of ionic is electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions because you get a positive ion being formed and a negative ion being formed. Between those ions, you have electrostatic attraction. For covalent bonds, those are the ones where it looks like a Venn diagram. So you got the shells overlapping um, you've got a nucleus here and a nucleus here and you've got electrons being shared in the middle. Okay, so what you have this time is electrostatic attraction between the nucleus and the shared electrons. So loads of people make this mistake. They think covalent is electrostatic attraction. Uh, sorry, they think it's um, intermolecular forces in covalent. Inside the actual covalent bond, it's not intermolecular. Inside the covalent bond itself, it's electrostatic between the, nu uh, the nucleus, let me draw this a bit bigger, and the shared electrons. So make sure you don't make that mistake. When you do get intermolecular, is when you have simple molecular substances. Okay, so for covalent, there's two types of covalent compounds you can have. Well, actually, if you're AQA, you learn a third one as well. Uh, the main ones, it can either be simple 
molecular or it can be giant covalent. Simple molecular, this is the one with intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces. Giant covalent is only made up of covalent bonds. Um, and if you're AQA, you also know, you need to know about polymers. Uh, that's like a more complex, simple molecular substance. It's uh, um, It's got molecules, it's got really long molecules with stronger intermolecular forces. Okay, right. So I'm not going to go too much into this. We've got a video on bonding on my YouTube, so you can go into that and watch that. We've got specific questions on bonding. So... CB stands for covalent bonding. Sorry, that's covalent bonding, that's intermolecular force. It's intermolecular force, yeah? So I'm not gonna go too much into that. This question is not even about bonding. Um, so let me go back. So the question was, which element reacts with potassium to form an ionic compound? So like we said, you need a metal and a non-metal to get an ionic compound. So we need it to react with a non-metal so metals are on the left-hand side of the peri periodic table. Non-metals are on the right-hand side. So which one do you guys think it is? So it can't be L. So people are saying J. So technically, there's only two non-metals here. So we've got one metal here potassium is a metal we got uh, two non-metals j is a non-metal q is a non-metal okay if you actually look at the periodic table this is carbon things in group four don't really form um ionic compounds they're quite unreactive the ones that you'll learn are groups one two and three and five six and seven mostly carbon doesn't really react with uh potassium the answer is q So Q, I'm not sure what that is. That's um, fluorine, chlorine. I think that's bromine on the periodic table. Uh, so you can get potassium, potassium bromide being formed. So that's the element that reacts with potassium. This is uh, AQA, guys. Okay. Okay, on to the next question. Which element forms ions with different charges? So out of all of these, which ones form ions with different charges? What do you guys think? This is higher. So we got M, M. Yeah, M's the answer. Do you guys know why it's M? Um, it's M because it's uh, in the middle of the periodic table. Uh, that's in the transition metal section. I think this might just be a, a triple um, question. I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head, but if it's a transition metal, it can form more than one type of ion. So the answer here is M. Yeah, so I don't think it's combined. So don't worry about this if you're combined. Uh, which element has three electron shells? Everyone needs to know this. Which one would you say has three electron shells? I'm hoping no one falls for the trick here. So we've got M, we've got J, we've got L, we get a mix of answers. Most people saying, so what was it? Period, three electron shells, three electron shells. Again, M, no, the answer's not M actually. 
it is L. Why is it L and not M? So it's asking for period three. I'll tell you what mistake people did. It's because you guys have forgotten that here we have an extra period. Let me rub all of this out. So I think what most people did is they, lab they thought it's one, two, three. So the M's here, but it's not actually like that. You've got to recognize that hydrogen is in a separate period. So this hydrogen and helium are period one. Then it goes period two, three, four. So the answer is actually L. It's a bit of a trick question. <laughs> it's only one mark. Don't worry if you didn't get that. Everyone understand? Good. Right. Um, yeah, there's loads of comments coming in. I'm trying to I'm trying to reply, but if you guys can answer anyone else's questions, please do. Right, let's look at this question here. So we've got an experiment going on. A student investigated the law of conservation of mass. Conservation of mass is just that, the mass before reaction is equal to the mass after the reaction. So mass cannot be created or destroyed. It has to always be the same before and after a reaction. So what have they done? They've gotten two beakers. We got beaker A, we got beaker B. Okay, so they've poured lead nitrate into beaker A. I'll put lead nitrate, I just put LN there. Potassium chromate, potassium chromate in here. And they've measured the mass of both beakers and contents. So they've actually put the whole thing onto a mass balance and seen how much it weighs, both for A and for B. Then they poured the solution from B, so they put all of this pot potassium chromate into the lead nitrate, and then they measured the mass of both beakers. So at the end, uh, beaker B is going to be empty because all of that's going to have gone in here, and beaker A is going to be uh, much more heavier. Okay, I hope you guys understand what's happening here. So what's happening is when you pour this in here, the lead nitrate and the potassium chromate are going to react. It looks like a complicated uh, reaction. Don't worry too much about it. Um, just remember reactants products. So these reactants are reacting to form these two products. What would the students see when the reaction takes place for one mark? What do you guys think? Bubbles and gas given off? No, no bubbles and gas given off. So firstly, why is there no, how can you tell there's no bubbles or gas given off, guys? Yeah, state symbols. Look at these state symbols. Aqueous, aqueous, solid, aqueous. If bubbles are given off, there has to be something with a gas. Bubbles are literally gas, so if gas is given off, then that would be uh, bubbles. Here there is nothing. There's a solid um, that's formed here. That's what we would see. We'd see a precipitation occurring inside the, inside the beaker. It'll probably go cloudy. So that's the answer for that. Solid formed here. What's AQ? AQ means aqueous. I was actually going to post a video on that today. I'm probably going to do it straight after this, um, where it explains it. It's an electrolysis video. So aqueous means dissolved in water to form a solution. Not the same as liquid. Liquid is when you melt something until it turns into a liquid. 
aqueous is when you dissolve uh, it in water. You, you put it in water and it dissolves. So to turn something into a liquid, you need to get it to its boiling, uh, so its melting point. Aqueous, you don't. So for salt, for example, salt is a NaCl, sodium chloride. It's very easy to make NaCl aqueous. You literally just put it into a cup of water and it dissolves. But to get into liquid, it has a very high melting point. You need to heat it up to a very high temperature. So, yeah, because um, there's a solid here, so you're starting off with two aqueous solutions and then you get a solid formed. So that's what you'll see. Can you say precipitate form? That is actually what the main answer is. Yeah, precipitate. The solid is called a precipitate. But you can say solid as well. But if you get a solid form from two aqueous solutions, we call that a precipitate. A precipitate is literally a solid formed from two solutions. Yeah, so if you've got two, if you've got aqueous reactants and you get solid formed, you call that a precipitate. Okay. All right. On to the next one. So we've got a table here. We've got masses. So we've got the mass of beaker A before you mixed, mass of beaker B before mixing, and then you've got A and B. So as expected, remember what I said? I said all of B is going to get poured into A. So at the end, B is going to be empty. It's just going to be a beaker. A is going to be heavier. So if you look at that, it makes sense. See, look, B has decreased in mass. A has increased in mass because you've poured all of it in. So show that the law of conservation of mass is true. So mass is conserved. So the mass before has to equal the mass after. How can you prove that using these numbers? What do you guys think? Yeah. Add them together and compare. They should be the same. So add everything before add everything after the reaction, they should be equal to each other. If you've got a calculator, try that. Tell me what you get when you add the top two. This is before mixing and after mixing, and you should get equal, equal answers. Conservation of, uh, law of conservation of mass means mass before a reaction equals mass after reaction. Anyone got the answer? Anyone with the calculator? 257.68, yep, thank you very much. So for you working out, you do 128.71 plus 128.97 equals, and then 154.1, plus 103.58 equals, and both of them should equal 257.68, 257.68, um, and then just put a statement at the end saying mass of products is equal to the mass of reactants, and that gets you the second mark. That's 154, sorry, not 59. That should be a 54.1. Formula sheets? No, you don't get a formula sheet. All you get in chemistry is a periodic table. So you need to know all the equations for moles. You need to know moles equals mass over MR, uh, the concentration equations. You need to memorize everything. All you get is the periodic table. Yeah, not fair. Okay, next question. What is the resolution of the balance? Resolution. Anyone know what resolution means? This is like a practical question. Yes, going live tomorrow. Definitely. Day before the exam. Tomorrow at 8pm will be going live. Yep, smallest number.
Resolution means the smallest number this mass balance can weigh. So you can tell by all the decimal points, what is the smallest number? Look at that, it's got two decimal points. All the readings, even this one has a zero at the end. It has two decimal points. So what would the resolution be? Exactly, 0 0.01. Because all of these are 2, two dp, it can definitely read smaller than 100, definitely more than one because it's got decimal points. 0 0.1, if it was 0 0.1, the readings here would be 128.7. This would be 129 because it'd be rounded up. This would be 141.1 without the zero. So the fact that it can read a second decimal place means the resolution, the smallest reading you can read is 0 0.01. Okay. Shall I explain that again? Um, so yeah, your way, you're using a mass balance, okay? So this is your mass balance and it's going to give you an answer um, of, so if you, if you put a, a beaker on that, it's going to give you a reading. Here, all our readings is 128.71, they're all to 2 dp. So the question is asking, the resolution basically means what is the smallest possible reading you can get on this mass balance? So imagine you took everything off, it would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. What's the smallest possible reading that you can get is if that last zero was to turn into a one. So it would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.01, wouldn't it? That would be the smallest possible reading. Therefore, that's the smallest mass that you can read on that mass balance. Therefore, your reading is 0 0.01. Everyone understand? Good. <clears throat> right, we got a question of working out MR here. Calculate the MR of lead nitrate. Not straightforward because this has brackets in it. So you, yes, you get periodic table. Usually in the question, they just give you the numbers, makes it much easier. So what do you do when you get brackets? Do the inside of the brackets. It works just like maths. Do the brackets first. Then that two basically means times everything in the brackets by two, then add PB onto it. Let me know what you guys get when you try that out. This is a higher, not 151. Not 151, no, uh, not 299, yet 331 is what you should be getting. So let me show you, uh, you got PB, so that's 207, plus we got two NO3s here, right? So let's put this all in a bracket. Put NO3, so NO3 is, N is 14, plus O3, so that's three O's, so 16 times three, I'll just write 16 plus 16 plus 16, all of that times by two. So do this bit first, 14 plus 16 plus 16 plus 16, put that in calculator equals, times that by two, then add the 207 at the end, and you should end up with 331 as your answer is no pb is not multiplied in the bracket no it's outside the bracket so leave that out leave that separate do this bit first the inside of the brackets times it by two and then add on the 207 at the end I hope that made sense this is combined and triple, should be able to do this, calculated MR. Um, yeah, everyone should be able to do this. Okay, next one. Uh, right, here, formula of potassium chromate is this. The charge on potassium is plus one. What is the formula of chromate ions? Oof, anyone know?
why do you times by two? Sorry, let me go back here quickly. Times by two because there's a two outside here. So work out what NO3 is here, times it by two. Then you add the PB on. This is AQA. Second one, not the second one. Right, mix of answers. How do you work it out? Yeah, the answer, the answer is this. How do you work that out? It's the last one's the answer. Anyone know how you actually work it out? Was it lucky guess? You need a vid on this. I have a video of how to do this actually, this method on YouTube. I'll show you guys in a second, but this is the method. Whenever you have, yeah, swap and drop, that's the one. Whenever you have two different ions, so you see here, it says potassium is plus one. CrO4, we don't know what charge that is. That's what we're trying to find out. So what you do, whenever you want to work out the formula of something like that, you get the two ions. So, okay, let me do an ex another example. Let's do, um, let's do calcium hydroxide. So calcium, is Ca2 plus because that is in group two. If you look in the periodic table, it's group two, you can work it out. Hydroxide, this is one you have to memorize. You need to know hydroxide is OH minus. So what you do is you combine the two together and you swap the numbers around. So you see this is two plus, this is minus, it's actually minus one. So get rid of the charges, swap them, and you get Ca, that one comes to the Ca, and then the two goes to the OH. So it becomes CaOH2. You don't write ones in the formula, so the final thing is CaOH2. Okay, so if you want to work out this one, you basically work backwards. So you swap the numbers around. We've got what the final thing is. The final thing is K2Cr4. Cr4, yeah? So Cr4 is an ion. There's only one of them. So you can, you can kind of write one here because there's a plus one. The plus one goes here, the two, goes up here to make it two minus. Okay, so it's literally swapping the charge and I've got a YouTube video, if you guys don't get that, I've literally got a YouTube video which goes through so many questions, uh, so many examples on this, uh, where is it gone? Videos, go to this one here. Uh, how to write any chemical formula, go on to this one and- A single elements, first of all, what you can do is you can actually... Yeah, got a video and um, it goes through loads of different examples. It goes through all the um, ions you need to memorize um, and you can print off the sheet um, and practice it, switch, swapping around if you guys want to go through it. Okay, so do that. Um, just go into my bio and go to the YouTube and uh, try that out if you don't understand fully. Okay, so that's why this one here is... CR4, two minus, that's the answer there. All right, on to the next question. Another student also tests for the law of conservation of mass using the same method, but different reaction. Look at that reaction here. Why would the student's result not appear to support the law of conservation of mass? What do you guys think? Yes, it's to do with gases. 
Okay, so it is to do with gas as you guys have spotted it. See here, we've got CO2, we've got gas produced. Now we need to get three marks out of this. So one of the marks would be to say gas is produced, yes. And then what are the other two marks? Yes, it escapes. So gas is produced and it escapes. Therefore, it's going to lower the mass. Okay, so let me explain that. So imagine you've got like a, a beaker or a conical flask. Reactions going on, you're weighing it. Conservation mass is not going to stay the same because the gas is going to escape. The gas itself has mass. If you had a rubber bung in it or something, it'll keep all the mass in. But if you if you leave it open because the gas is uh, being made, it's going to escape. Therefore, the mass is going to decrease and it will look like the uh, mass isn't conserved. But it actually is. It's because we can't weigh the gas. That's why uh, we don't think it is conserved. Uh, you don't need to write in fuller sentences. No, you can write in bullet points. Okay, good. On to the next one. Here we got electrolysis, everyone's favorite. I'm joking, I know it's not. Um, when different salt solutions are electrolyzed with inert electrodes, the product at the negative electrode is always a metal. Describe how you test this hypothesis in the lab. Draw a label diagram of the apparatus. So this is literally just a drawing uh, how electrolysis looks like. Uh, what type of things do we need to add in here, guys? Power pack, yes. Get a battery in there, cell or battery. This is AQA, yes. Electrodes, yep. Definitely most important thing. You've got the electrodes, you've got two electrodes coming off it. And you need a solution inside a beaker. Yeah, when you do this, make sure the solution goes above the electrode. Yeah, Don't, make sure it's fully submerged just to be safe. Uh, label diagram, so let's label everything. We've got the electrolyte solution. In here, uh, we've got our two electrodes. Do you guys know which one's which? We've got two electrodes, cathode and anode. Which one's the cathode and which one's the anode? How do we know? Positive one is on the left. So anode is on the left, cathode is on the right. The way we know this is by the size of the arrows here. You see here, we've got two arrows. The longer side is always the positive side. The shorter side is always the negative side. So the, long, the, line, the longer line is always connected to the positive side. The shorter side is always connected to the negative side, okay? Um, yes, I'm literally going to post a video on this um, as soon as this live's over, explaining how whole of electrolysis works. So I hope that helps everyone. Um, so let's label that. That's the cathode. Anode, you don't need to label battery, um, that's fine. Yeah, going live tomorrow, 8 p.m. So independent variable. Remember, the independent variable is the one that you change. Dependent variable is the one you measure. So what is the independent variable here, would you say? Yes. 
Yes, the solution, good. The question says, different salt solutions are electrolyzed with inert electrodes, the product of the negative electrode is always a metal, different salt solutions. So that means you're changing the salt solution every time. And observation, what would you actually physically see in this reaction? At the negative, it's asking about the negative electrode. Not fizzing, not fizzing because it's a metal that's being formed. When, the, when a metal is being formed, it's not a gas. Only gases fizz. If a gas is produced, then you'll see bubbling and fizzing. So you probably would see it here on this side, but not on the negative side. Don't say rusting either. Coating, yes, we get a metal coating. When a metal is formed in electrolysis, it coats the outside of the electrode. So if it's like copper, for example, the outside of the electrode, it'll, be, it'll go from being like graphite, like black, to um, a copper color. So observation is that metal coats or deposits. On the electrode. Mm. We don't need to mention about which one's more reactive. Yes, it's going to be on YouTube, guys. I'll put, I'm going to try and put it on YouTube tonight. Met mm. Can't hydrogen gas be released if the metal's more reactive? Yes, it can. But we're talking about uh, met the metal being coated. It says if the hypothesis is true. So if a metal's coated, you'd get a metal coating here. If you're right, if hydrogen was formed, you'd see bubbling if it was hydrogen. But here it's saying assuming that the hypothesis is true. Thank you. Paige, thank you. Um, okay. The student's hypothesis is only partially correct. Explain why the product at the negative electrode is not always a methyl, method, metal. This is what you guys were talking about. I forgot who it was. Someone mentioned hydrogen being formed. Okay, let me go through the rules. Again, this is going to be on the video that I'm going to post literally after this. Uh, let's remind ourselves of the rules. So these rules are for aqueous Uh, electrolytes. So remember what aqueous means? Aqueous means dissolved in water, not molten. Okay, it doesn't work with molten. So aqueous electrolytes, you can have a positive ion and negative ions. I'm not going to spend too long on this because I also have a YouTube video on loads of questions on electrolysis, which explains all of this as well. OK, so the rules for positive ions is. The less reactive. Element. Will go. To the cathode. What about the negative? Do you guys know uh, what what goes in the negative side? I'll talk about the negative ion, sorry. So on the anode, how do you decide? It's not the more reactive one, no. No, no, no. If you've got... um. Halogen, yes, I got one person said it, I think it's to do with the halogens. Okay, so for negative ions, guys, if a halogen is present, halogen is just anything in group seven. If halogen is present, then it will go. What happens if a halogen is not present? 
what will go. Yeah, OH, OH minus will go to form oxygen. Okay, so like I said, guys, I went through that quite quickly. Um, I did a live on just electrolysis questions. So you can go onto YouTube, it's somewhere here. Um, I've got all the chemistry ones somewhere. So go to live exam, walk through replays. Here's, I put all the chemistry ones at the top. We got electrolysis here, bonding, mole calculations, and last time we did energy in reactions. So head over to that if you want to practice questions on that. You can print out the questions. You can do them as you watch the live as well. So definitely do that if you want to um, practice. And also, I am so close. Sorry, I'm not wasting time. I'm saying so close to getting a thousand subscribers. I really want a thousand. So if you guys could help me out, that would be great. <laughs> All right, so back to this. Um, the student's hypothesis is only partially correct. Explain why the product at the negative electrode is not always a metal, because sometimes hydrogen can be produced. Like I said, um, if it is more reactive, then hydrogen then hydrogen will be formed okay that's two marks there any questions on this does that make sense it is uh higher Yes, it's higher. I'm not sure if it's not, if it's combined or not. Probably, uh, no, sorry, it is combined. It is higher. It's triple. I'm not sure if it's foundation or not. So can someone confirm uh, with him? Do you need to say cathode and anode or is positive and negative electrode all right? Uh, for which one are you, which question are you talking about? So they're talking about negative electrode here. It depends on the question. Here, you don't need to mention it because they've already said it. It's relevant for triple and combined. The question itself, I think this is, I think this is combined. How long am I live for? Not, not much longer. I'm going to keep going though. So you guys can stay as long as you want. Um, I should probably in maybe another 10, 15 minutes. Predict the product of the positive electrode of sodium chloride solution and copper sulfate solution. Okay, so we need to use our rules here. So we've got sodium chloride solution, Na plus Cl minus ions, okay, for sodium chloride. Copper sulfate, what ions are present in copper sulfate, guys? Copper, yep. Cu2 plus. And sulfate. These are ones you need to memorize. So I posted all the ions you need to memorize like a few days ago. Sulfate, hydroxide, nitrate, um, carbonate. Those ones you need to all memorize. Uh, so make sure you do that. Also on that YouTube video that I showed you with the working out formulas ones, I've got a list of all the ones you need to memorize. So yeah, so for sodium chloride solution, we've got this, but it's in solution, it's aqueous. So what else is present? If it's aqueous, there's also what else present? Water, but the water splits up to form. Yeah, you're right. It's, a, it's all dissolved in water, but whenever it's in water, when electrolysis happens in aqueous solutions, you always get, thank you, H plus 
and OH minus ions. This is when we start using the rules. Okay, so this is uh, aqueous. This is also aqueous. So this has H plus and OH minus ions. So whenever this happens, whenever you've got solutions, you have to decide out of the two positive ones, which one's going to go, out of the negative ones, which one's going to go. Okay, so we use our rules here. So out of sodium and hydrogen, which one's going to go? Remember the, uh, the rules. For positive ones, it's always the less reactive element that will go to the cathode. So out of hydrogen and sodium, which one's less reactive? Hydrogen, yeah, it's hydrogen. I think the, um, yeah, the only ones that are less reactive than hydrogen are copper and silver, if you want to memorize it that way. Every other metal is more reactive than sodium. So it will be hydrogen formed. And in the negative one, will chloride be uh, go or will hydroxide go? Chlorine, yes. Because remember the rule for the negative ones is if it's a halogen, it will go. If it's not a halogen, the other, uh, the other one will go. The OH minus will go. Good. Let's do the same on this side. Out of the positive ones, we got copper, we got hydrogen. Which one's going to go here? Copper. Well done, guys. Remember what I said. The only ones that are less reactive than copper uh, than hydrogen are copper and silver. And then, out of the negative ones, when I what do I mean by go? I mean actually go to the electrode. So you're going to have uh, Cu two plus here. It's going to go to the cathode, and it's going to turn into copper, and it's going to uh, coat it. The other one was um, SO4 and OH minus, so SO4 two minus and OH minus. So I'm asking out of these two, which one's going to go to the anode? It's going to be hydroxide, yep. Because remember the rules for those is if it's a halogen, the halogen will go. If there's no halogen, OH minus will go. Here, there's no halogen. It's uh, it's literally just uh, SO4 two minus, so no group seven elements there. So it'll be the OH minus that goes. If the OH minus goes, it's going to be oxygen. So answering our question, what's going to be produced at the positive electrode? So it's only asking for the negative ones. We're going to say, what is our answers then, guys? For two marks, what's produced? Don't put the ions, put the final product. Chlorine and don't say OH minus. No, it's oxygen. So chlorine gas is formed. Oxygen gas is formed. Yeah, the reason is oxygen is OH minus is the ion. This is the form that is in inside the solution. When it goes to the electrode, that's when it switches to um, oxygen. It basically uh, it loses electrons and then it turns into oxygen gas. It's dissolved in water. Yes, before it's dis it dissolved in water, the OH minus is dissolved in water and then loses its electrons and turns to oxygen gas, and then you see uh, bubbles being formed. Okay. All right. Um, let me give you guys a chance to screenshot this. So I'll carry on next, tomorrow. We'll go through more stuff tomorrow. I'll give you guys more questions. We'll do some more calculations in there, some energetics as well. I'll try and get some questions for energetics um, so you guys can screenshot this now